21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Now, where is this? Yeah. Yeah. How many people are hurt? How many? Were there two cars involved or a pedestrian? Yeah. You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the Please nerve center. Cars. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. The officers will be right there. Yeah, and the ambulance, too. Just stay there. Okay. Twenty-first precinct transcribed. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the twenty-first. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. As soon as I turned out the platoon and the men who would patrol the precinct for the next eight hours marched out the front door, Patrolman Bailey, the station house attendant, and Patrolman Winkler, the precinct youth patrolman, appeared with three large corrugated cartons to begin decorating the muster room for the Christmas party, which would be held for neighborhood children in the station house the following afternoon. I went into my office to read and sign reports, which would be taken to the 6th Division by the precinct messenger. When I finished the job at 9.15 a.m. and came back out into the muster room, Winkler and Bailey already had the tree up and were beginning to decorate it. I walked around behind the desk where Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard desk. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Captain. Hello, Sergeant. Well, what was he doing? What's going on, Red? Pretty quiet, Captain. All right. Winkler. Yes, sir. Yeah, Isn't that tree smaller than the one we had last year? No, it's just about the same size. No, I think the one we had last year was a little fatter, Red. Yes, sir, I guess that's it. Uh, Lieutenant. Yeah? Vaquero's got a lost child over there. He's bringing him into the station house. Well, doesn't the kid know where he lives? Vaquero says he's only about three years old. He's been looking around for about 20 minutes in the stores over there. The kid says he was with his mother shopping. All right. Uh, where are you going to put the tables, Winkler? What'd you say, Captain? Where are you going to put the tables? Right here along this wall. Refreshments there and the presents here. I think that'll be all right. Yes, sir. Red, uh, have you got a car to take me on patrol? Yes, sir. Uh, Sergeant, have number three come by the house to take the captain on patrol. Okay, Lieutenant. All right. I went down and got for some of you. Now, what are you going to do about it? Do about what, Red? You know very well about what. I told you about what. Did you? I was here yesterday and I told you all about it. You told me there wasn't anything the police could do and that I would have to go down to the magistrate's court and get a summons. That's what you told me. I didn't tell you anything, lady. I didn't even talk to you. Oh, yes, you did. And I did just what you said. I went down to the court and I got a summons out for it. Lady, I wasn't even here yesterday. I was off. Was he? Yes, he was off. He wasn't here. When you were sitting right where you're sitting now... We've got four lieutenants in this job. Well, he looks just like you, except that I don't think he has red hair. He doesn't. I suppose I'll have to go through the whole story again, then. Who's paying for that Christmas tree? Not the taxpayers, I hope. No, ma'am. The men pay for it themselves. Oh, well, that's good. Suppose you tell me what the trouble is. Well, as I told him yesterday, I had a perfectly legitimate complaint. This old man who lives across the hall from me is conducting a business in the building. People come in there all day and all night long disturbing my teeth. Trooping up and down the stairs with packages. You think it was a store on Fifth Avenue instead of an apartment? Well, that's not a police case, lady. So I was told yesterday. And did you complain to the super of the building? Oh, you can't get very far with him. All he told me was, why don't I leave the old man alone? He's not hurting anyone. So I said, he's disturbing my peace. Well, he wouldn't do a thing about it. Not a thing about it. Then I came over here yesterday, and the man without the red hair who was sitting right there told me if I wanted to make a complaint against him, I would have to go down to the magistrate's court and get out a summons, and that's exactly what I did. Here it is. Oh, uh, Winkler. Yes, sir. Uh, you've got too many blue ones together in a bunch there. 
Waverton. Right there. Oh, yeah. I'll be I bet you haven't been paying a bit of attention to one word that I've said. I sure have, lady. I heard every word. Well, I wish you'd look at me when you listen. You, uh, you said you've got a summons out for him. That's right. And when I got it, I told them clerks down there at the court that it's a shame I couldn't just get a policeman to go up and arrest him. That it has to be up to a woman like me to act on her own initiative. So he told me what my rights are. He told me I should go to the station house and talk to the desk lieutenant and that the desk lieutenant would have to send a policeman to serve the summons. No, he didn't tell you that. Oh, yes, he did. I know what he told me. He told you that if you were afraid you might be harmed physically, that a police officer would be sent along to stand by while you serve the summons. You're the one who has to serve it. Well, what's the difference? <laughs> There's a lot of difference. Are you going to send someone over there with me or not? May I see the summons, please? Of course. Thank you. His name is Ernst Wolfschmidt? That's right. And your name is Myra Beaven. I spell it B-E-A-V-A-N, but I pronounce it Bevan. The address is 761 East 77th Street. I live on the third floor, and he lives right across the hall. And if I don't get some satisfaction out of this, I'm just going to withhold paying my rent. That's all there is to it. It's just making me a nervous wreck. Uh, do you know whether he's home now? Well, I don't know for sure. I haven't been there myself. Is it uh, Mrs. Bevan? Yes, Mrs. Bevan. I'm a widow. What's this man selling out of his apartment, do you know? He's selling everything imaginable. For instance? Well, I saw some portable typewriters in there, and radios and fountain pens, toasters, electric clocks, watches, fitted cases, everything like that. You were in and looked at it? Oh, I should say not. Yeah, his door opened last night, and I saw into his place. The merchandise is up to the ceiling, and people keep parading up the stairs all day and all night and keep going out with packages. Oh, brand new merchandise? Well, it looks new to me. And did you tell the other lieutenant that when you were in here yesterday? No. How could I tell him if I didn't get a good look inside his place until last night? Did Mr. Wolfschmidt ever offer to sell you anything? I don't even talk to him. How old is he? Oh, in his 70s, I'd say. Early 70s. Does he work? Not that you could notice. He doesn't. How long has this been going on, Mrs. Bevan? He's selling to people, you mean? Yes. Would you mind telling me who you are, please? I came in here to talk to this lieutenant. I'm Captain Kennelly, the commanding officer of the precinct. Oh, thank you. How long has it been going on? About four or five days now. And you never noticed it before, his doing business from the apartment, I mean. No. Winter. Yes, sir. I never uh, noticed. You'd better hold that ladder for him. It looks a little shaky. Okay. Uh, do you have any idea where this merchandise came from? No, not unless he stole it. I wouldn't be surprised if he did. I wouldn't put it past him. Supposed to be such a lovable old man. I bet you he's a thief. <laughs> I bet you that. Well, that's a conclusion you can't jump to hastily. But uh, I wish you'd do us a favor, Mrs. Bell. Oh, what is that? I'd like you to tell the detectives about this. About Wolf Smith? Yes. I would be delighted. Yeah. Will you see that Mrs. Bevan gets upstairs, Red? Yes. Captain. All right. I'm going out on patrol, Red. Oh, Captain, before you go. Yes, Miss Bevan. If I don't see you again, I wish you a very merry Christmas. Thanks, Miss Bevan. <laughs> and the same to you. I went into my office for my overcoat, then out through the front door and down to the curb where patrolman William Coley was sitting behind the wheel of sector car number three. I got in and instructed him to patrol toward the northern boundary of the precinct where I made two stops on precinct business both at garages in connection with applications for renewal of their tow car licenses. Procedure in these cases requires the precinct commander to personally interview the applicant. After these calls were completed, I instructed Patrolman Coley to make a tour of the retail areas in the precinct so that I could observe the traffic conditions which were aggravated by the holiday crowds. At 10 minutes after 11, a call came over the air for us to ring into the station house. I instructed Patrolman Coley to stop at the closest call box. All right, you stay here, Coley. I'll ring in. Morning, police precinct, Sergeant Waters. Captain Canelli, box 19. Uh, Lieutenant Gorman wants to talk to you, Captain. Okay. Oh, yeah. 
Yes, uh, there was a woman fell down the steps at the 67th Street station of the 3rd Avenue L on November 10th. She's starting a personal injury suit against the city. Get out the aided card on the case from the UF-18 and leave them on my desk. Yes, sir. All right. Let me have Lieutenant Gorman. Yes, sir. Lieutenant, Captain Canelli's ringing in. Hold on, Captain. All right. 21st Precinct, Lieutenant Gorman. Yes, Red, Captain Kennelly. I uh, sent that Mrs. Bevan upstairs to the detectives, Captain. Yeah? Lieutenant King, listen to what you have to say. Was he interested enough to go over to the building? Well, at first he sent over and Scallon over there to have the super let them in for a look around. Then about a half hour later he went over himself. He just rang in here and asked me to get in touch with you. Well, what did he find, Red? What's that address again? 761 East 77th Street, Captain, third floor. Did uh, Lieutenant King say the stuff might have been stolen? He says that's what it looks like, Captain. Well, have they got any idea who the old man has been selling the stuff to? Well, that's what makes the whole thing so funny, Captain. What do you mean, funny? From what they can make out so far, the old man hasn't been selling it. He's been playing Santa Claus. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. The car, after completing my call to the station house and instructed the operator, Patrolman Coley, to drive to 761 East 77th Street, the address of Ernst Wolfschmidt and the woman whose complaint started the investigation. As we pulled into the block... I saw the detective squad car parked in front of the building, which was an old but clean five-story tenement. After Patrolman Crowley parked, I told him to wait in the car, and I walked into the building and up the stairs to the third floor. The doors to the two apartments were open. In the first one, I saw Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, talking to another man. Oh, let me see. Hello, here. Captain. Matt, I come here in 1948 to work in the building. That is, he was a tenant then. Captain Kennelly, Mr. Joe Linwick, the super of the building. Mr. Linwick? Oh, I'm glad to know you. Well, how do you like this, huh? All we got to do is put out a catalog and we're in business around here, huh? Yeah, well, we sure would be. Three portable typewriters, Captain. Yeah? I count 11 portable radios and clock radios, different makes. Oh, yeah. Half dozen toasters, three waffle irons, seven electric clocks. The five dozen pen and pencil sets, about a dozen Swiss watches, two kitchen mixers. Well, that's only in this room. You should see in there. Do you know where he is, man? No, sir, not yet. Well, he'll come back. He's never failed to come back. Oh, uh, my car is parked downstairs, Matt. We better get it out of there. Yes, sir. Uh, Scanlon's with Mrs. Bevan. He'll take care of it. Good. Scanlon. That's... Coley's the operator. Coley's downstairs waiting in Captain Kennelly's car. Go down and tell him to pull around the block. Okay, Lieutenant. Well, this looks like stolen goods for sure, huh? Well, I can't make it for anything else, Captain. I don't know what got into the poor old guy. He's the nicest fellow you ever met. Don't bother nobody. Minds his own business. I understand he doesn't work. No, he don't. He told me he's on a pension. He was 25 or 30 years with some company downtown. Pension must not be much, though, because every once in a while he runs short. He comes to me and borrows a dollar, two dollars, until his check comes, he said. I'll give it to him. He never fails to pay it back. Never fails. Have you any idea how he got this stuff? Well, I, uh, I got a sneaking suspicion. What's that, Joe? Oh, it was one afternoon last week. Well, I wasn't around here. I got another job I worked part-time at, you know. My wife told me there was a man knocked at the door and said he had some cartons to be delivered to Ernst Wolf Schmidt, and there wasn't any answer from the bell. Well, she said, all right, she'd let him in. She got the pass key. She went upstairs and opened the door. The first thing you know, she told me two guys come up the stairs. They're carrying a big box each. They set them down in the middle right here, and she started to lock the door. They said, no, wait a minute, there's more. So they make two more trips upstairs. Six carton go together, my wife said. They put them inside, she locked up, and that was that. Mm. Did she see the truck they came off of? Well, not that I know of. Did she sign a receipt for them? Well, she never mentioned it. Uh, what is your wife now? What do you think? 
Christmas shopping. What time do you expect her home? When they chase her off 34th Street, she'll come home. She's the kind of woman, when she gets inside a department store, she loses all sense of time, direction. You know what I mean? Well, we'll talk to her when she gets home. Did uh, Wolf Schmidt say anything to you about the stuff that was delivered? No. No, he didn't say a word, except like I told you. Well, he gave me a radio, just like this one here, only in black. Didn't you think that was kind of peculiar? Well, I didn't think it was peculiar, but I, I told him he didn't have to do it. He said he wanted to. He said me and my wife had been very nice to him, very nice to him when we didn't have to be. Of course, I didn't know about all this, this stuff at the time. I, I didn't see it yet. I figured maybe he, he hit a horse or something like that. Didn't you think there was something peculiar about all the people coming up to his apartment? To tell you the truth, no. I mean, if a guy goes into business, he goes into business. What's peculiar about selling something out of your flat? What I thought was peculiar was when I found out he wasn't selling it. He was giving it away. When did you find that out? Oh, to be honest with you, not until last night. The kid that works in the delicatessen down the block told me. It was going on right under my nose, and the kid that works in the delicatessen has to tell me he's been giving it away. <laughs> you just get a $25 electric razor. How you like that? Who else did he give the stuff to? From what I understand, he was stopping people on the street right and left. Strangers. Telling them to come on up to the place. He had a Christmas present for them. Well, some of the people came, and some thought he was a little a little mixed up in the head, which I guess isn't too far from the truth. I don't know. But I, I can't figure it out. What is, what is he doing with all this stuff? Where did it come from? When you find out, will you let me know? Yes, Joe. When we find out. I understand Mrs. Bevan complained to you about the people coming up here. Ah, oh, that. Well, she complained about anything. She complains about no heat, too much heat. No hot water, water's too hot. Well, she even complained once about the full moon shining in her window. Like I could turn off the moon, you know? You think I'm going to have to give my radio back? Well, if it's stolen, you will. Oh, I don't know. That's what I get for dreaming. I was picturing myself sitting on the stoop next summer on a hot night, you know. Can of beer, that radio, listen to ball game. Captain, <laughs> officer. Speak to the devil. Yes, Miss Baron. He's coming. I saw him coming. Yes? I was looking out my window and I saw him coming down the block. That thief, that criminal. Are you sure it was him? Of course I'm sure it was him. You get back inside your apartment and close the door. We'll handle it. I'm entitled to stay here, don't you see? No, I don't. I'm entitled to serve my summons. You do that later after we get this straightened out. Now, I suggest you get in your own flat. If that's the way you feel about it, all right. But you don't seem to remember who stopped. See what that means, Captain? Yeah, I see. Uh, you want me to get out of here, too? I, I just as soon. I, I kind of like the old... No, I think you'd better stay, Joe. All right. You go out in the hall and take a look. See if he's coming up the stairs. Okay. Come right back in. As soon as I see him? Yeah. Well, I guess you'll get your answer soon, man. Yes, sir. I guess I will. <laughs> sure got hold of a lot of merchandise. Yeah, he didn't buy it. That's a cinch. He's coming up, Lieutenant. All right. Let's shut the door. Did he see you, Joe? No, I don't think so. Poor guy. I, I hate to see him in a mess. All right. Quiet. Here he is. Nine o'clock. My feet hurt me. You sit down. There are 
plenty of more chairs. Take the fountain pens off the chair there. Would you like a fountain pen? Put one in your pocket with a Merry Christmas. Now, look, Mr. Walshman. Joe, maybe we all have some coffee, huh? Go in the kitchen, put the water down for the coffee, huh? I, uh, I, I don't think I care for any, Mr. Wolfman. The, the captain would like some? And the lieutenant? No, no, we don't care for any, thank you. So there's no use having coffee alone. I'd like you to tell us how you got all this merchandise, Mr. Wolfman. It, it came, that's all. Did you steal it? Me? Did you? No. Did some friends of yours steal it? My friends don't steal. If my friends stole, they wouldn't be my friends anymore. Well, where did it come from? It was here. I found it here. Well, did you care where it came from? It came to me. My name was on the boxes. Well, who do you think sent it to you? I don't know. Do you have any idea? I thought who might send it to me. I thought and I thought. I, I couldn't think of anybody. Then how do you think it got here? In the carton. Uh, didn't you think it was a good idea to make some inquiries about it? But my name was on the boxes, my name and my address. And you did nothing about it? Oh, sure, I did something about it. I, I did a very lot about it. What did you do? Well, I had no idea what was in the boxes. I opened them up and I saw all the beautiful things, things that people want and need and love to have. So I did something about it. What? Well... Whoever sent it knew that I couldn't use five typewriters. I couldn't listen to 11 radios. I couldn't write with all those pens. So I thought I was the one who was chosen to make people happy for Christmas. To give them away to good people who wanted them and needed them to use. Well, who do you think chose you to do this? Well, it could have been some good person who chose me, but then I... I don't know anyone who would have that money to spend. So I thought... What did you think? Oh, it would sound silly saying it to you. But thinking of it, it doesn't sound so silly. I thought maybe God sent them. Oh. To make people happy with. I see. There are so many people that can be made happy and need to be made happy. When all this arrived, I, I thought that was what for. I went out and found people who needed it and could use it. And deserved it. I didn't care about any of it for myself, really. Listen, I... I think I, I could use some coffee. I'll, I'll go put it up. Can, can you find everything, Joe? Yeah, sure. It wasn't right to give it away? We'll get it all straightened out. I'm sorry if I did something wrong. Well, at least your heart was in the right place. In another few minutes, I left the apartment and resumed patrol. I instructed Patrolman Coley to make another tour of the shopping districts in the precinct to check the patrol conditions. We were headed for the station house when a call came over the radio concerning an automobile accident, ambulance responding on the East River Drive. We made the run. A car had overturned attempting to avoid a collision and the driver had been injured. I remained at the scene until the victim had been taken to the hospital and traffic restored to normal. It was nearly one o'clock when the car pulled up in front of the station house. I got out, crossed the sidewalk, and walked up the worn stone steps into the muster room. I headed around behind the desk to sign the blower. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Captain. Hello, Sergeant. Okay, seventeen. Well, they did a good job decorating in here, then. Yes, sir, they sure did. What's doing? Nothing much, Captain. Except that Matt Keen came in with that old man. Oh, yeah? Did he uh, find out where that merchandise came from? Uh, not that I've heard of, Captain. All right, I'll be in my office. Yes, sir. I left some messages on your desk, Captain. Okay. Would you tell Fallon I want to see him, Sergeant? He's taking his meal, Captain. Is there anything I can do? Just tell Fallon to see me when he gets back in the house. Yes, sir. I'll be in my office. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Uh, yes, sir. Captain? Yes? Lieutenant King is bring it down for you. All right, put it on my line. I'll take it in there. Yes, sir. Twenty first precinct, Captain Canelli. Lieutenant King, Captain. Yes, Matt. We've got that old man, Mr. Wolfschmidt, up here in the detective squad. 
Yes, I know. I found out where that stuff came from. Where? Well, Scanlon had a brainstorm. Yeah? He got out the Manhattan telephone directory and looked up Wolfschmidt. There happens to be a discount store at 761 West 77th Street run by an Ernest Wolfschmidt. E-R-N-E-S-T. Our friend is Ernst. E-R-N-S-T. The same number on the west side. Yes, sir. That's right. I called over there. The Wolfschmidt who owns the store told me he bought a bankrupt stock in Jersey last week in order to chip in by truck. This merchandise, all right. He was wondering what happened to it. As a matter of fact, he'd already called the trucking company. And they addressed the shipment East 77th instead of West 77th. Yes, ma'am. That's what it looks like. And the similarity of names clinched the deal. How about our Mr. Wolfschmidt? Santa Claus. Too bad that stuff didn't come from where he thought it did. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah. Well, what's the address? Two oh five? Two oh nine. Yeah. Yeah? Oh, is anybody hurt? They have a gun? Yeah. Yeah. Which way? Was he on foot? What kind of car? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department city of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Santos Ortega, Bill Zuckert, Abby Lewis, and Bill Smith. Written and directed by Stanley Niff. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Bob Pfeiffer speaking.